So yeah, so thanks for hanging around here. This uh, the Zoom meetings, uh, we are all a bit tired of it, and I, I really appreciate it for for everyone to uh, uh, stay on. And I hope I'll, I'll make the uh, yeah the time worthwhile. Um, so what I would like to talk to you today about is an all optical uh, approach to uh, super resolution imaging of molecules in their nanoscale cellular context. And I'll, I'll cover essentially two different techniques today. One is uh, uh, focused on the single molecule localization microscopy super resolution techniques. And the other one in the second half of my talk, I would like to talk about uh, expansion microscopy, which is, is essentially the, the attempt by the chemists to take over the super resolution microscopy from us optical uh, scientists. Um, but nonetheless, it's actually pretty exciting. So um, what... Uh, these approaches I'm talking about today uh, are essentially addressing is this dream that many of us microscopists have. Wouldn't it be great to be able to resolve every single molecule in a cell, identify its uh, identity or determine its identity and its location, and of course, ideally do that all uh, in a living cell and see how it's moving. Um, However, we are quite far away, unfortunately, from really fulfilling this, uh, this dream here. And um, the first problem, of course, is this tiny scale bar, um, which uh, is in violation of the diffraction limit of light microscopy, which uh, is 250 nanometers and not 10 nanometers. And therefore, the structure that I just showed you would really be blurred at this size scale of about 250 nanometers uh, if you really would uh, try to uh, image it. So one solution there is to achieve that resolution down to the 10 nanometer scale is uh, to use electron microscopy, as, as we all know. Electron microscopy really gets us that down to that resolution, but we lose the identity of the molecules. We don't have specific labeling, and therefore we get this gray scale image rather than the colorful image I showed you before. So in, on top of resolution, we need specificity so that we actually know what we are looking at. So, one solution to this approach is super resolution fluorescence microscopy. Here we label our molecules of interest with a fluorescent tag. And therefore, uh, we get the specificity and the resolution we get from the super resolution uh, approaches in, in, uh, that have been around now for uh, a couple of decades. So um, the technology I want to first cover today uh, is that of single molecule localization microscopy or is uh, we know it as, as a storm palm or f palm. Sorry, I need to get this here, the images out of the way. And uh, and here we uh, are circumventing the diffraction limit, which prevents us from seeing a detailed structure like this, and is uh, instead results in this blurred image by looking at a very small and therefore sparse subset of single molecules. So each of these uh, single molecules we can segment out with a computer algorithm, determine its center very precisely, and then plot the location of each of these molecules in our image with super resolution precision. And then we look at uh, tens of thousands of uh, stochastic subsets of these single molecules and assemble our super resolution image over time. And as you can see over um, like uh, typically minutes of recording to an hour of recording or so we will acquire our super resolution image. This is around for a while now, uh, since, since 2006, uh, and I, I'll not uh, cover many details here. I just want to show one uh, advanced setup that we have built over the years uh, and then show you an example. Um, and that's this for pi single molecule switching setup where we use two opposing objective lenses, uh, detect fluorescence from both sides, combine it coherently, uh, which means we are actually uh, combining here single photon, or we use single photon interference uh, to really uh, get our interference pattern, and then uh, obtain a super resolution image with about 20 nanometer um, resolution all three directions. And uh, we have made some recent success, or we have obtained um, recent um, advances here uh, and, uh, in multicolor imaging in 3D here in this particular, and this is a data set we are very proud of. This is showing the Golgi complex uh, imaged in 3D in three colors uh, using this methodology. We use three different antibodies labeling uh, three different proteins in the cis, medial, and trans cisterna of the Golgi. 
uh, these cisterna are stacked like pancakes here in this convoluted uh, Golgi complex. And if you now label them here separately in different colors, then you can see here the stacking of the Golgi here, for example, uh, quite nicely. Um, there's another location coming up here to the left here. And this uh, we are really excited about because these cisterna are less than 100 nanometers separated uh, from each other. And it's completely impossible to resolve this complex 3D structure without any of these resolution techniques while we maintain the specificity of the staining here. And, and uh, we are really proud of, of having obtained this using these approaches. You might say, well, this looks still a little bit grainy here. Um, I see all these kind of blurry or noisy patterns here. And you're right, this is something which is not perfect. And the reason for that is that the fluorescent dyes we're using blink. And this blinking process is, is, is uh, very diffi difficult to control. The blinking events are not necessarily super bright. And we therefore struggle with uh, getting good localization position and getting enough blinks to really get a high localization density here. And uh, this brings me to uh, what I really want to talk about uh, in this first half of the talk. And this is uh, this DNA paint modality of, of these single molecule localization microscopy techniques. This is not something we invented. It's primarily coming from Ralf Jungmann's lab, but it's something which I really believe is the future in, in many of these single molecule localization techniques. Here, instead of making molecules blink uh, photophysically, um, we uh, take advantage of blinking through uh, uh, binding and unbinding of uh, diffusing molecules. We have a single stranded DNA um, with a probe, a fluorescent probe attached. Uh, we call that the image probe. And the single stranded DNA can bind to its complementary counterpart uh, here as the docking strand, which is attached to the protein of interest. And it will bind so transiently. When the molecule diffuses around, it's essentially in an off state. We, we can't localize it. It diffuses around too quickly and just contributes some, some blurry background. But if it's transiently binding, it will become immobile. And during that time, it will emit a bright localized flash of light. And that's what we can localize. We call that the on state. See, the advantage over the photophysical blinking techniques uh, in palm and storm is that we don't have to make a compromise on the choice of flow force. We can just use the brightest flow force and the best buffers for that uh, that we can find. And this approach is also resistant to photo bleaching. If we bleach one of these molecules away, it will transiently be exchanged anyway. It will fall off the docking strand after about a second, and it can be replenished by new imager probes in solution. The disadvantage of DNA paint, however, is that these imager probes in solution contribute background. And if you have many of them, this background can overwhelm the uh, single molecule signal of the bound molecules. And uh, you therefore have to uh, manage your background quite carefully. So um, you typically uh, either have to fight with high background or you need to lower the imager probe concentration. And that requires that the binding uh, on rate becomes quite uh, the, uh, low, it uh, takes a long time then to acquire enough blinking events, and you therefore need to image quite slowly. And this has really been one of the big bottlenecks of DNA paint over the last years. And uh, we have addressed this now with the development of a fluorogenic DNA paint probe. And this is a paper which should come out in a month or so in Nature Methods, hopefully. Um, so here we have replaced our regular DNA paint probe by one which has a Floor four on one end and the quencher on the other end. If the molecule diffuses around, the quencher and the floor four get close enough that the quencher is, quenches the fluorescence, uh, probably through a mix of contact quenching and, and uh, for, uh, first resonance energy transfer. But when the molecule binds to the docking strand, it will be stretched out. The quencher will be far enough away from the uh, from the floor four that the floor four can can. Uh, emit fluorescence essentially unhindered, in an unhindered manner. This might remind you of molecular beacons, which have been used uh, in um, chromatin imaging for a long time. Uh, but our sequence is much shorter, so that we really have this transient binding event of only a few tens of milliseconds. And uh, we also don't stabilize the molecules with the stem so that we can really get the maximum on binding rate uh, possible. Um, to uh, uh, 
separate the quencher far enough from the floor for yet uh, achieve uh, um, a transient binding only and not long term binding, we uh, have engineered internal mismatches in the sequence here uh, to really get a high dissociation rate, yet a, uh, a nicely separated uh, distance here between flow four and quencher. And if we apply this in bulk, this uh, or test this in bulk solution, this indeed uh, works quite well. The regular DNA paint has a very moderate uh, phylogenic effect of about 1.8 fold uh, between the free probe and the bound probe, uh, while this phylogenic DNA paint probe has nearly an 80 fold increase in fluorescence upon binding. And uh, it reaches levels uh, which are nearly as high as the levels that we see in the regular DNA. Uh, paint probes. So and this really, uh, as I'll, I'll show you in the next couple of slides, allows us to image 25 times faster than in regular DNA paint probe. And we do not require optical sectioning like total internal reflection microscopy uh, anymore and can really apply this in 3D imaging. So here's the data for the uh, uh, speed improvement. In the top row, you see a regular DNA paint probe where we imaged uh, two microtubules here on a cover slip. And it takes about eight hours to really obtain a high quality image of microtubules. We see the, the microtubules as hollow uh, tubules essentially here. Um, while we get a similar image quality in the phylogenic DNA paint probes after only 20 minutes. Um, we can quantify this and really it represents a 25 and a 0.8 fold in, increase in, in, in speed here uh, with which we can accumulate these blinking events. And uh, just one quick example here for the 3D imaging capabilities without any optical sectioning. Uh, we are looking here at mitochondria, where we label an antibody the outer membrane of the mitochondria, and um, can um, see uh, quite nicely here the mitochondria is hollow tubules. Um, and, and I think you can appreciate the, the good signal to noise ratio and the, the high quality data that you can get with this kind of samples. So with that, I, I want to end the first half of my talk and switch over to the second part. And uh, for that, I want to come back to my dream here that I uh, uh, mentioned earlier. So this is the ideal. Um, this is what I said we could get with super resolution fluorescence microscopy, but this was actually not completely true because we, what we get with a super resolution fluorescence microscope is this. We can see the location of individual single molecules, and we can see it in multiple colors, and that provides us with some context. But we do not get the same context here uh, that the electron microscope image, for example, would provide. To really get that context, the only method we can currently really rely on is that of correlating super resolution fluorescence microscopy with electron microscopy. This indeed provides the context. You can now see a specific uh, uh, molecules highlighted with a fluorescent tag uh, in the context of the uh, general ultrastructure of the cell, uh, which is provided by the electron microscope image. But I think it's fair to say that if you want to do that, especially in three dimensions, uh, that it requires highly specialized instruments and days or even weeks of continuous data acquisition to obtain a single 3D data set of mammalian cells. And um, I, I have the highest respect for the people uh, who have developed this technique. I think these are real hero experiments, but it's not something which every one of us can do in their labs uh, on, a, on a daily basis. So what I would like to uh, show you today is an alternative that in many instances, I think can replace uh, this uh, correlative uh, light electron microscopy or CLEM, and that is called PAN expansion microscopy. So in, it's based on expansion microscopy, and, uh, and it's a special version of expansion microscopy, where you, we embed our sample in a hydrogel in an iterative manner, and, and you can expand the hydrogel through embedding it in, in uh, pure water, um, and you do that iteratively. So you embed the fixed sample in a hydrogel, you denature it to break uh, the bonds between neighboring molecules, uh, uh, and then you swell the hydrogel uh, by replacing the buffer um, and uh, the sample becomes four to five times bigger. You then stabilize that gel uh, in, a, in a new hydrogel, a neutral hydrogel, uh, and add a third expandable hydrogel. You digest the first two hydrogels 
and you can expand the sample a second time by another factor of four or five. And in, you can in, now at the end uh, add labeling. And we can do that because we have retained our protein content throughout this process by entangling them the, uh, the, the proteins in this polymer network. And this has been a development that was enabled here by my grad student, Ons M. Saad, in her PhD thesis. So now we can label our proteins of interest with antibodies of interest. But on top of that, we can also add what we call a pan staining, where we essentially label the whole proteome with an unspecific label like an NHS ester, which will bind to all primary means. And that, as I hope I can convince you in the next two images, it provides us with correlative light electron microscope-like images, but obtained just with a confocal microscope in one image session. So uh, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. This is this palm staining on a non-expanded cell. Uh, NHS ester has been around for decades, and this explains why we haven't used it much in fluorescence microscopy, because you don't really see much. You see essentially the whole cell lighting up without much detail. However, if you apply this to a one -fold, uh, once or twice expanded sample, you actually start to see now details that were previously obscured by the resolution limit. So we zoom into here this 16-fold uh, expanded sample a little bit more. Now you can actually resolve here the Christie of mitochondria, the stacking of the Golgi, um, as well as other uh, ultrastructural features, uh, just with a confocal microscope image. There's no optical super resolution here. This was really just obtained with a confocal microscope in our imaging facility. So I'll show you uh, here at this example, the, the comparison to electron microscopy. We look here at the centrosome, this bright structure here in the cytoplasm of the cell. And uh, if you adjust the contrast and zoom in a little bit, you see here the mother and daughter centriole. And now we invert the color table and look at this. In, this is not exactly the same sample, but a, a comparable sample. And, and you see the two uh, centrioles in different orientations. And we put them next to electron microscope data uh, that has been published in the past. And while we do not obtain the same resolution that electron microscopy obtains, we do see features which become quite similar. And, and we can see the same kind of ultrastructural features uh, here, just in our confocal microscope image. We see these distal appendages here. We see the pericentriolar material. We even can get a glimpse of these microtubal triplets that, that uh, show up in this orientation. But on top of that, this is still compatible with specific antibody stainings. For example, this uh, polyglutamylated alpha tubulin antibody, uh, which will then reveal the location of this particular uh, protein uh, modification here within the centric. So we get this clam-like image. And this is not limited to cultured cells or centrioles. We can apply this, for example, in, in the cultured neurons. Um, here we look at Homer and Bassoon, a pre and a post synaptic, uh, or post and a presynaptic marker in synapses. Uh, this is the palm staining using the NHS ester, where you can see the postsynaptic density lighting up the active zone. Here's a synapse, right? Uh, post synapse, presynapse. And uh, you can overlay the two and get uh, now can really re reveal where Homer and Bassoon are localized within the synapse. And uh, we can apply this not only to cultured neurons, we can apply this also to brain uh, tissue sections, and we can do this also in 3D. And, and here we are looking at a, uh, a mouse brain section of a Thigh 1 GFP mouse, which expresses GFP using this Thigh 1 promoter. In sparsely and a few neurons, um, uh, we then label the GFP with an antibody. And uh, you see here a part of a dendrite with kind of the dendritic spines here in the context of the other neurons and uh, uh, um, uh, neuropil of the, of the brain here. And uh, this is now a 3D data set. And uh, you'll, you'll see as we zoom in that uh, we can really now resolve the dendritic spine architecture in the context of the brain, uh, at the same time get kind of a specific highlight of one particular neuron. Um, we uh, zoom in here, you see here one dendritic spine, for example, highlighted by this uh, Thigh 1 GFP. And, and here's again the, the um, presynaptic uh, and postsynaptic uh, uh, zone. 
So this is uh, not published yet, but uh, the first part of the story here about the expansion microscopy was published in a Nature Communications paper in 2020, in case you would like to learn more. Um, I'll, uh, I'll end here since my time is up, and I would like to acknowledge here current and former group members, especially would like to highlight here uh, Kenny Chung, who has uh, spearheaded the DNA paint through genetic probe development, and Ons Emsard, uh, uh, who has developed the PAN expansion microscopy. Uh, I further acknowledge here many collaborators at Yale, as well as outside of my funding sources, and I would like to uh, thank you for your attention. And I would be happy to take any questions there. Thank you.